way. I ask for the Holy Spirit to come through this house. Right now, in the name of Jesus, speak to your children. Speak to the dry bones. Speak to the dry hearts. Speak to the minds that are troubled. Lord, we release it to you. We release everything to you right now. Tomorrow has its own troubles as well as today. But we choose right now to be in this moment with you and not take it for granted like Pastor Ryan said. Lord, rattle us this morning. Shake us from the core. God, I speak a blessing over this offering and over your children as they bring to sow the seed. I declare this is good ground because this is your ground. And we no longer are going to try to do things the way that we want it, but we're going to release it to you and allow you to do what you would want to do in this ground. Open up our eyes to see what you would have us see. Open up our hearts to receive what you would have us receive. And let us release the things that we are not meant to hold on to. Lord, bless this offering. Bless your children. Bless the worship. I declare as they continue to worship that it will be a declaration of the next move that we're going into. And that your children will surrender to that move. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we thank you for being our shelter. We thank you for being the miracle worker. And Lord, we just worship you this morning. If you have an offering this morning and you'd like to bring it, please come forth and bring it. Continue to worship. As you go back to your seat, continue to just to worship within yourself. Disappointments is Sunday's empty tomb. Yeah. Since the wind has impossible it ever stops you. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire is stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling.
just as the storm that was rolled at the tomb in the garden. What happens when God says to move? I feel Him doing it now. I feel Him doing it now. I feel Him doing it now. Do it now. Do it now. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. to this nation. I believe God is speaking to this church. I believe God is speaking to the hearts of individuals right now where we are. Saying do you believe these dry bones can live? And I just want to be like Elijah and say Lord only you know. Only Father you know. if it's in your hands of course they'll live. Lord if it's in your will of course they'll get up Lord. But I got to leave it to you. And he said, Lord, he said Elijah I want you to prophesy to these bones. And he did it, and the Bible says that they arose up, bone to his bone, but there was no life in them. Then he said, I want you to prophesy to the four winds of the earth. And when he prophesied, the Bible says that the four winds of the earth blew, and it blew upon them, and the bones received life. The breath of God came into them. But it didn't start until he was willing to obey and to prophesy. When he was willing to hear the sound of something that had not yet started moving. When he began to declare the promise before it had yet to be revealed. And I don't know about you this morning, church, but I believe God is telling some folk, it's time to prophesy. It's time to start listening again. It's time to start seeking again. And you're going to find what you've been looking for. You're going to hear what you've been searching for. And you're going to gain what's been promised. Hallelujah, Jesus. I hear the sound. 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 The dry bones are rattling. Dry bones are rattling. I hear the sound. 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 Dry bones are rattling. Dry bones are rattling. the Lord some praise in this place. Amen. amen. Dry bones rattling. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb of God. Can we give our praise team a big hand this morning? Awesome, awesome job. We are just blessed and honored and just full of opportunity this morning. Amen. The only thing that stands between you and a breakthrough this morning is your attitude. How many is ready for a breakthrough this morning? 
Praise the Lamb of God. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of playing these little games with the devil. I'm tired of giving up real estate in my mind to his schemes. I'm tired of giving him freedom to say whatever he pleases. And I want to help you this morning if I can, and if you'll let me. I want to take you in some scripture, and I want to show you how to shut him up for good. I want to show you how to put the devil on the run. And I'm not talking about your neighbor. I'm not talking about your sister. I'm not talking about your daddy, your mama, or your brother. I'm talking about the enemy, the adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion who goes to and fro in all of the earth, seeking whom he may devour. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to go with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Once you find it, uh, it is our custom here, and I, I believe fully in standing up in reverence for the reading of God's holy word. So when you find it, if you will, please stand for, his, for the reading of his holy word. We'll pray, and I'll let you be seated. And then after that, you can, uh, you can stand when the Holy Spirit tells you to stand. Amen. Um, but as you find it, I want to just um, do a quick announcement before I forget. Um, I know we got a lot of people that signed up for the uh, Zoom class that we're going to be teaching on principles and process of biblical study. This is something new we're doing at Northwoods, and um, it is not a requirement to, to volunteer or to serve in the church at all, but it will be a requirement for those that seek to further their study their life in ministry or to ask if you if you were seeking credentials down the road i'm going to require that before i send you down there um that you've you've put in the effort and the time here um and and also um i believe this is a sacred pedestal i believe that there's nothing about me standing here that makes it powerful but i do believe that this is an, a place of opportunity and that i must be very careful about who stands here and who delivers a message here and it must be contextually sound it must be biblically sound it must be holy spirit led and I believe in this class, you're going to learn the principles and the processes of biblical study, how to properly read the Bible, how to study the Bible, how to go. There is a actual, actually an order you can study the scriptures in that will help you and bring you to the conclusion of what God is trying to show you. Um, if you'll take the process. And a lot of times us, as, especially in this modern day culture, we are a drive through. Um, we are a drive through generation wanting a, a, a red lobster meal. Um, we are a drive through. We want it now, but we want to have all the, 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 the goods of Longhorn, but we want to get it in Burger King drive through. But I'm here to tell you that the process will be the biggest and greatest thing you'll ever go through in your life. Because it isn't the end of your journey. Remember I preached on this being rooted? At the end of your journey, your purpose, your final destiny, your final destination when you get to the end of your life. And you look back, it ain't going to be, this is what I lived for. You're going to realize at the end of your life that your true destiny was all the things you've done along the journey. Which concluded to your final destination. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the class for tomorrow night, I was not using my mind when I scheduled July 6th at 7 p.m. With it being 4th of July weekend, we have people that are still out of town. We have people that still have family events that they're going to. And I don't want to get in the way of a holiday opportunity for people to spend time with their family. We are still going to get on tomorrow night, but we will not start the class until next Monday night. Um, I don't know what the date is next Monday night, but it'll be at 7 p.m. And we are going to get on tomorrow night. It is Zoom. So if you do not have the app, it is a free app, Zoom. Um, you download it. And then what I would do is I got the list of everyone who signed up here. If you have any question of whether or not your contact information has been given to the church, please come see me before you leave so we can make sure that we have your contact information. We will be doing it through a group text message. Um, one thing I will, I will put in the text, and I'll go ahead and say now, if you have to respond, to the text message, please do it to me personally. Do not respond to the group text because I don't want to be responsible for everybody's phone getting 37 texts every time we send something out. So if you have to respond, respond to me personally. Don't respond to the group text. Um, but in the um, uh, tomorrow night, what we're going to do is I'm going to send out a code. When you click on join a meeting, then you will take that code and you will place it in the in the box. 
click on join a meeting and it should bring you up into the class and what we want to do is we want to try to iron out any wrinkles we might have or any troubles and go ahead and troubleshoot them that way next Monday when we open up at about we're going to open up about 650 between 650 655 and when that code gets placed in at seven o'clock we can start because my goal is to to, to give you the, the teaching for that night and then to open up the, the class for dialogue, questions, comments, um, anything that you might have learned along the way that you could add to the class is very much invited. So um, I hope and pray that, that everything works out with this. I'm excited about it, and I believe God's going to do some great things through it. With that being said, let's go to the Word of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1 through 11. Verse 1 through 11. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. <coughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Will you stretch your hands this way and pray for me as I pray for you? Father God, we thank you this morning. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray, God, that you would anoint this service this morning, that you would bless every ear to hear, every mind to understand, and every heart to receive what you are speaking unto your church. I pray, God, that you would give us divine revelation, that you would give us divine understanding, that you would give us divine intervention of your power and authority over our flesh, over our thoughts, over our uh, man-made ways, God. I just ask you in the, this morning, God, to just break down the traditions, break down the religion, and allow your Holy Spirit to grow us and mature us to where we are called to be. And Lord, we will be careful to turn back to you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' most holy name we pray and the church says, Amen. You may be seated all over the house this morning. If you have your phone, I'm going to ask you, if you, get a, if you hadn't already liked the uh, Northwoods Facebook page, take a moment, go on and, and look up Northwoods, like it, and then if you will, just kind of Reach over there, click on the live video, and hit that share button so that we can broaden our, um, our online family and we can make sure that those that are anticipating the service this morning don't miss it. Amen. And always to our online family, thank you guys for being faithful. Thank you for sharing every chance you get also. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, Making the Devil Flee. How many get tired of going the, over the same circles in life, going against the same devils, dealing with the same problems, the same headaches, the same frustrations, the same temptations, the same just terrible things that the enemy <coughs> would bring against you. You have the power over the enemy. Did you know that? Do you realize that you have the supreme power over the enemy? You've got authority over the devil. Because, not because of who you are, not because of anything you've done. As a matter of fact, without Jesus Christ in your life, you can erase everything I just said. Because without Christ in your life, you are no match for the devil. 
Without Jesus Christ in your life and in, in your heart, you cannot match and you cannot sustain and you cannot live out your life in a good way when you are tempted of the devil. You will find yourself falling because temptation is strong. As a matter of fact, the only way to be tempted is it has to come against something that your flesh desires. In other words, I don't like root beer. Last night, I was grilling at the house. There's, I'm going somewhere with this. Root beer is the drink that kids drink. But I don't like root beer. And I was grilling yesterday evening, and I have a cooler sitting by my, uh, my grill, and it's got some cup holders on top of it. And I looked, I looked down, and I, I seen a styrofoam cup, and I was like, my wife done made me a glass of sweet tea. Praise the Lamb of God. <clears throat> so I reached over there and I grabbed that thing up and I was thirsty. I turned it up. <laughs> We're going to go. It was a cup of root beer that one of the youngins had made and sat there by the grill. So it was not my wife doing something good for me. It was my kids sabotaging me. And I, 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 it was disgusting. I didn't even want to drink anything after that because I don't like root beer. So with saying that, if you wanted to tempt me, <laughs> to do something or to just say I was I was fasting and I was going through the day root beer wouldn't be what the enemy wants to use to tempt me to drink something because root beer is not good to me root beer has no place in my life I don't want it I mean even in my thirstiest moment give me a bowl of toilet water keep your root beer I don't want what you got if the root beer is all you got I want something that 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 is pleasing to me and so so the enemy is not going to tempt you in areas of your life that are unpleasing to you that is why you hear people all the time that are excited about making a move in their life or getting married or, or, or having a child or getting a job or moving away it's something that they want to do. So, of course, the enemy is not going to fight you if he knows that this is not the will of God for your life. If he sees that anointing, the enemy's been around long enough, he can recognize the path of a righteous man. The enemy's been around long enough, he can tell when you've got some, some warriors for Christ in the room. The enemy's been around long enough, he can tell when someone's being obedient and when someone's feeling good. And sometimes we feel good because the enemy tempts us with something that our bodies already want. And if we are not hidden in the shadows of the Most High God and we are not covered by the blood of the Lamb and we are not yielding to His Word and meditating on His Word day and night and putting it into our lives and in our spirits, we are going to be easily deceived into thinking that what the enemy wants for us is God's will for us. He'll move you to places you can't have ministry. He'll put you around people that won't let you speak truth. He'll put people in your life that will close down the vision God opened up for you. He will take out the opportunity to gain knowledge and wisdom and place it with opportunities to gain popularity and fame. And he will make you believe that because you are becoming successful in the world that this is the blessing of God. But I come by to tell somebody this morning that just because the devil knows how to bless this life he has no power to give you the blessing of eternal life the only one that brings the eternal life to you is the blood of Jesus Christ and you've got to trust and hold on to his unchanging hand because it is Jesus alone that can save you it is Jesus alone that can redeem you it is Jesus alone that can lift you up on the wings of eagles make you run and not be weary make you walk and not faint it is Christ alone that when you're in the valley of the shadow of death that no fear no evil can come nigh to you because he is with you your rod and your staff and they comfort you it is with Christ alone that you can do all things Amen. temptation comes to you through things that are pleasing to your flesh every sin that will ever be committed falls into three categories the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life Everything you'll ever do in your life, the enemy is ever going to try you with. He is going to try you with the lust of the flesh. He is going to try you with the, with the eyes, the, the things that your eyes want to see, the things that your ears want to hear. 
He is going to make you believe a lie. The enemy has the power to try to make you believe a lie. But if you are bought with the blood of Jesus, he cannot break down those barriers. But the scary part is, is when you're not covered by the blood of Jesus, the Bible says even he, God, will make you believe a lie. He will turn you over to a reprobate mind and make you believe a lie. That's why I've asked myself all my life, how in the world does a Holy Ghost filled church get deceived in Revelation? How does a Holy Ghost filled body of believers get deceived? How does the very elect even possibly get deceived if it were possible? The reason it's not possible is because the Holy Ghost church ain't there. Amen. And everybody else that played church that went with the temptations of the flesh and the temptations of the eyes and the temptations of the heart. And they fell into those categories of pleasing the emotions instead of the spirit. The good news that I didn't come to preach about that this morning. The good news is, is I come to share with you how to make the devil get out of your house. How to make the devil get out of your marriage. How to make the enemy get out of your job. How to make the enemy get out of your church. How to get him out of your mind. How to get him off of your back. How to get him out of your children. How to get him out of your nation. How to get him out of your, your, your ministry is by resisting the devil and he will flee but there's more to it that's just the point i put this up here as my background today and i told brother i told brother gabe i said this is going to be my background the reason i'm putting this up here is because this is what you're going to hear quoted nine times out of ten resist the devil and he will flee from you and that is that by someone who already knows the depths of the word that's good that is a declaration. That is a decree. That is a promise of God. But for someone who does not know the word, they just hear resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that is the end all. I mean, that's just, I'm walking out the door and when the devil comes after me, I'm just going to, I'm going to fold my arms and resist him. And you're still going to fail in temptation thinking that it's not the devil, it's God. Because you are not ready and you're not prepared. But I'm going to help prepare you this morning. Is that okay? Awesome. The Bible says, I want to go to James chapter 4, verse 7, 8. I want to give you the whole text of what that background means. Seven, verse 7 starts out. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Whoa, that's more than just resisting the devil then, right? There's something to be afraid of hell doesn't make you heaven bound. To be anti-Satan doesn't make you holy christ field. And to be a church member doesn't mean that you don't have antichrist spirit. Okay? Because some folks would rather have their will in their way than have Christ's will and way, which makes antichrist. Because the Bible says you cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God. If you are a friend of the world, you have enmity with God. A friend of the world is an enemy to God. You can't have both sides of the fence. You have to love one and hate the other. You can't walk with good and with evil and expect God to bless you abundantly. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hand, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. you got to understand that Paul is talking to, or James is talking to, a congregation of people. So to go in there and to get all of that, you'll have to go study that. That's not my sermon for this morning. But there were things they were doing. But I bet you, with everything in me, I know as a matter of fact, because I've studied it, with everything in me, you will go see what we are seeing in modern-day America today. You will go see, what not only are you seeing in modern-day America, you will go see what we're seeing in the modern-day church today. People fornicating, adulterers, and liars, and backbiters, and, and, and sinners, and, and, and people claiming a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And people looking for the political stance to look good in the eyes of man, but yet don't give one, one, one iota what they look like in the eyes of God. I, much more, I would much rather be pleasing unto God and hated by man than to be loved by man and be hated by God. Looking at the text here this morning, I got to hurry up. I only got four hours left. 
in Matthew chapter 4 is a very unique story. But before you can truly respect Matthew chapter 4, you got to rewind to Matthew chapter 3. See, Matthew chapter 3 shows us something if you'll pay close enough attention. Matthew chapter 3 shows us that we got the same old devil and the same old tricks. Matthew chapter 3 shows us that the very same thing, that the very same temptation that came to man in the Garden of Eden is still a temptation the enemy uses against man today. Many of us look down on Adam and Eve for falling in the garden, but many of us have taken that fruit day in and day out. We've eaten the fruit of bitterness. We've eaten the fruit of religion. We've eaten the fruit of racism. We've eaten the fruit of, of hatred. We've eaten the fruit of, of, of division. We've eaten the fruit of denominations. We've eaten the fruit of it's me and my four and no more. It's, we've eaten the fruit. It's my way or no way. Many of us have eaten the fruits over and over and over, yet we hate Adam and Eve for doing it once. But what happens in Matthew chapter 3 is John the Baptist is down in the Jordan River and he's baptizing some folks. And then here comes Jesus down the hill. We know the story. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus said, I come to be baptized. And John said, who am I to baptize you, Jesus? You ought to be baptizing me. And he said, no, John, listen to me. It's very important. You get what I'm telling you. I need you to baptize me because I've come to do a work. I've come in human form. I've come to be 100% God, but at the same time, 100% man. And I can't redeem the world if I only operate as 100% God. I have have to operate in the form of man. I have to become flesh. I have to be baptized. I have to grow. I have to do ministry and I have to be crucified. And then God's part of me is going to rise up and I'm going to get up after three days in the grave and I'm going to hold the keys to death, hell in the grave and I will be the only perfect sacrifice that is able to save the world. And John the Baptist said, he may not have went into all that. I just felt good about preaching it right there. But he said, I need you to do this, John. And John baptizes him in the river. We know the story. The heavens open up. The Bible says the spirit like a dove came down upon him, lit upon his shoulder. And the Bible says that a voice from heaven spoke and said, this is. That's important. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say that this could be my son in whom I'm well pleased. He didn't say that I'm thinking about adopting this child and making him my son. In whom I'll be well pleased. He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Then watch how chapter 4 starts off. Then the, then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted tempted of the devil Let me, I want to read this one more time then Jesus was my goodness led up on the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil he went up to be tempted of the devil led by the spirit man that messes up a lot of religion right there man that messes up a lot of what's supposed to happen in the altar calls that messes up a lot of what we thought was supposed to happen when I went up for prayer. Because when I went up for prayer, God identified me with him. When I went up and I received the baptism of his spirit into my life, some gifts and anointings took place. Some things happened. But immediately after the baptism, he was led by the same spirit that filled him with dancing, with tongues, with talking, with prophecy, with healing, with miracles, with working, with, with preaching, with all these things. The same spirit said, now I'm going to take you away from the crowd and I'm going to put you in the wilderness somewhere all by yourself. And I'm going to put you here with one person with you. The devil. Some of us think that because we answered the call or we moved for God and everything fell apart and all hell came against us, that, that we, done done, we done disobeyed and we just stop everything. We quit everything. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a story in 2 Kings chapter 6 of a man, a servant, an apprentice who said, we need a bigger, we need a bigger uh, worship facility. We need a bigger school for the prophets. And they go out and they start making a building a school. And the man borrows an axe and he starts cutting. 
cutting on a tree. And in the middle of his swinging the power to the tree, he loses the axe head off of a borrowed axe. And all he's holding is a stick. And he does something that a lot of us are too prideful to do today. He went to the, to the uh, uh, man of God that was over him. And he went to him and he said, I need to talk to you, Elisha. I borrowed an axe and I was cutting the tree so that we could build this school. But my axe head fell off into this water. And Elisha, I love what he did. He came and he broke the stick and he threw it in the water. And the Bible, in the King James Version, he says it like this. And the axe head did swim. The axe head did swim. See, there's some things that you've got to do. When you lose your cutting edge, when you lose your ability to make change, when you lose your fire and your tenacity, when you lose your ability to worship, when you lose your ability to study, when you lose your ability to pray, when you lose your ability to seek out the power of the Holy Spirit, when you lose that tenacity to want to get a hold of the unchanging hand of God and never let go, when you lose that fire, it's time to step back, step down, and get back to the basics of getting in your word stop holding on to things and drowning everybody around you if you've lost the passion to do what you've been called to do be willing to get out of the way so God can heal you be willing to get out of the way so God can restore you there is nothing you've lost in your life that is saint that can't be revived there is nothing you've lost in your life that can't be restored there is nothing that's came off of your life that can't be revolved amen I'm here to tell you today that if you'll call on the name of the Lord he can make your axe head swim again he can make your ministry swim again he can make your ministry get up and touch hearts and change lives but it's going to take getting the devil out of your way. He goes on into led into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted of the devil. And then the Bible says in verse 3, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, if you don't read chapter 3, this part doesn't have a whole lot of power. But this is the revelation that the devil still uses the same old tricks. Chapter 3 said, this is my beloved son. Who said that? Who spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son? God the Father, right? He spoke it. Is God a man that he can lie? Absolutely not. The Bible says the exact opposite. God is not a man that he can lie. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But when the tempter came, he said unto him, If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. See, what the devil is going to do is when you start getting your identity in Christ, he is going to send something along the way to make you question who you are. He created man. Let us make man in our image. So he formed man from the dust of the earth. And he done something in this creation that no other creation had gotten. He breathed life into it from his nostrils. And man became a living bee. And then he took from the rib of the man and he created the woe man. And because she was taken from the man, he said we were called him. Her woman, her, uh, she would be called woman, and her name was Eve. And they walked in the cool of the day with God. And then here comes the tempter in there. And what does he ask Eve? Did God really say that if you eat this, you shall surely die? Yeah, he said that. No, you won't die. You will be like him. Oh, yeah. See, what happened was he, the enemy knows how to flavor stuff up to make you forget the last conversation you had. He knows how to flavor some stuff up to get folks focused on the now instead of the history. He wants to erase your history so you'll focus on now, and now will be your history forever. 
He wants to take away what God spoke to you. When he said, let us make man in our image. They will be like us. This is my image. This is me. It's my breath. And then the devil says, no, if you eat this fruit, you will finally be like him. As though God was hiding something from them. As though God was against them. As though God was imprisoning them. I don't know about you, but there's been some moments in my life, even in ministry, where I have felt imprisoned by my ministry. Brother Josh, what do you, what do you mean? You know what? It isn't because God is making me do things I don't want to do. It's because I got this old ugly, ragged flesh on my body, around my spirit, and it's got this carnal mind that wants to poke its little head up every now and then. And I start asking myself, what can I do to please the man? What can I do to help the growth? What can I do to make people want to be here? What can I do? Oh, if I need to open a bar in the foyer, we'll do it if it gets people here. Oh, if I need to, and this, we do crazy stuff because we want success in the world. But the Bible tells us plain as day to resist the devil and he will flee from us. To resist him and he will flee, to get out of our face, get out of our lives. So he goes on, he tells him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And you know, I, I asked myself this question. I said, Jesus was God in the flesh. He was the Son of God. He was, he was God incarnate. Do you realize if Jesus really wanted to, when the, he didn't even have to have a conversation with the devil. He could have looked at that tempter and he could have said, listen here, you snaggle tooth, no good, lying piece of trash from the pits of hell where you will burn. He said, he could have easily said that. He could have said, bow on your face right now and repent for speaking to the holiness of God like you just spoke. He could have easily commanded at that moment that the world be wiped away and everything in it be cast into the lake of fire with the tempter. That's probably what man would have done. Man would have wanted to show his muscle. Man would have wanted to show his power. Man would have wanted to show his authority. But in the moment of pride, pride cometh before a fall, the Bible said. In a moment of pride, Jesus would have lost the opportunity to redeem the lost and to save the wretched sinner into his saving grace. But aren't you glad Jesus is not a man of pride, but he was able to humble himself under the mighty hand of God, and he was able to stand his ground with the devil, but he didn't give up, and he didn't feel like he had to prove himself to nobody. He did something that is the key to making your enemies flee. He gave him the word of God. The only, go to Ephesians chapter 6 and study the armor of God. The only piece of equipment in all of the, everything on the armor is for your protection. It is to defend you. It is to, it is to uh, uh, cover you. It is to protect you. There is only one piece of the armor that is an offensive weapon. It is the sword. The Word of God is the sword. The Word of God is the power. The Word of God is how you defeat the things coming against you. Having done all things, stand Put on the whole armor of God. You ain't, God didn't create you and save you for you to sit down and look like this all the time. I don't know what I'm going to do, Lord. This life's just too hard on me. I just, I just can't get the devil off my back. He's just doing, t- and I'm not doing that to pick fun because we've probably all done that. We get, the, we get the bottom lip ministry going on. Nobody loves me. Nobody ever want to do what I want to do. Preacher don't never say nothing to me. He don't never give me a word. 
I don't need to give you a word. My word is a man's word. Get God's word. His word is pure and holy and it'll never fail. His word would never return void. His word would do exactly what it was sent to do. We get, on, we get in these places and we look defeated. But can I tell you that, that I, when, when, when you look at the, 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 the analogy of the Roman soldier used in Ephesians chapter 6, when he says, uh, put on the whole armor of God, I don't see anything that says it covers the back, which means you were never meant to run from the devil. You were never meant to run from your enemy. You were never meant to turn your back on the things God put you in. You were never meant to turn your back on the ministry. You were never meant to turn your back on the promise. You were never meant to turn your back because everywhere God sends you, there's a devil sent to guard it. But I'm here to tell you that if you have done all things and you'll stand with the sword of the Spirit in your hand, you will cut down, you will tear asunder, you will break down every object of the enemy if you're willing and ready and able. I got something specifically for Northwoods here in a few minutes that I'm gonna I'm gonna close us with. But he goes on and he gives him another temptation. He said, well, he says, if, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Anytime the devil walks up in your territory, he's coming with the intentions of taking something with him. Anytime the enemy comes up in your house, He's not there to visit. He's there to take something with him. Every time he comes up in your marriage, he might not cause a divorce on day one, but he's going to take something out of the marriage. He's going to take something out of the ministry. He's going to take something day by day, piece by piece, and then the joy you once had, you have no more. You've got preachers divorcing churches. You've got churches divorcing preachers. You've got people divorcing husbands and husbands divorcing wives. You've got parents divorcing children and children divorcing parents. Because they're walking along the journey, not recognize that the enemy is coming day in and day out and taking a little at a time. And while I'm right here, young people... There's one thing he can take from you. It is your innocence. If there's anything the devil wants to take from you is your ability to be looked at as pure, to be looked at as holy, to be looked at as righteous. And I'm telling you, you've got to guard yourself because there are perverts. There are adversaries. There are weirdos, if you can use it like that. There are people in this world that don't care, don't care one, one thing that happens to you. All they care about is seeing you destroyed as long as they get happy guard yourself but I love what Jesus did he didn't just say shut up devil we got folks today that just want you to walk out into the world and say coronavirus go and I'm not saying, I mean, there's days God's going to give you that kind of commandment he's going to say I want you to stand up and say go but then there's other days you don't argue with the headache. You don't argue with the issue. You just remind the issue in your presence of where you stand. You are here, devil. But let me tell you, you used a piece of scripture against me. Let me give you full context. It is written, devil. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I believe what Jesus was doing right there was going ahead and setting the standard for the devil. That I know you got a couple more tricks up your sleeve before this conversation ends. But I'm going to go ahead and plant this in your mind. I know my word. I know where it stands. And I can be hungry and it don't matter. Because I don't live by bread alone, but by every word. So when you start trying to twist the word, you Leviathan spirit, I'm going to tell you how to straighten it back out and I'm going to put it right back where it belongs I'm going to put it right back in context I'm going to put it right back where it belongs because you don't know how to use the word Amen. knowing a scripture knowing it's history or knowing it's context is not enough because even the devil knows scriptures even the enemy knows how to give you chill bumps even the enemy knows how to make the hair on your arm stand up. As a matter of fact, I deer hunt. And on a cold November morning, at 7 o'clock in the morning when that sun's cresting and all that cold is coming up out of the ground and the temperature is about 713 degrees below zero, at least that's what it feels like when you're in the street and you can't feel your toe, 
I get chill bumps the moment I get warm. That's because it's just a lot thing that happens in life. The enemy knows how to touch your flesh. Remember what he done with Job? You can't take his life, but you can touch his flesh. The enemy knows how to touch your flesh. The enemy knows how to touch your mind. But he cannot have your spirit unless you yield it to him. And he is not going to come in on day one when you are baptized on fire for God, full of the Holy Ghost. He's not going to come in and say, Sister Ashley, I need you to give me your spirit right now. I need to use it for the rest of my life. No, he's going to walk in. He's going to say, I need you to do a couple more things because it'll make, be ha- you'll be happier with your kids if you'll do a few more things. You can put the Bible reading till later. He just took your Bible study. And then he's going to come in and he's going to say, Oh, you're getting so good and you're getting so strong. People are loving you. It's time for you to just go out and make sure that the, you need to go out and politic for Jesus. Because you know God needs politicians, right? He needs, he needs, he needs us politicians. He needs us to go out and make sure people know why he's the God, the one true God. Absolutely not. But that's what our mentalities tell us. The enemy comes and tells us, you need to go politic for Jesus. Just put your Bible study off a little longer. You're still doing a good work because you're politicking for Jesus. Vote for Jesus. This Sunday, don't worry about it Monday through Saturday. Just on Sunday, vote for Jesus. Can I tell you that the enemy does not mind if we come into this church and the gospel gets preached and folks get full of God and folks get on fire for God and folks get up and dance and shout. He don't like it, but he can live with it. He's all right for people to come into this building and to get full of God and to hear the gospel preached. The thing the enemy don't want to know and don't want to see is folks walking out this door carrying the promise. What Folks walking out this door knowing who they are. Folks walking out this door declaring who they are. And being able to speak the word of God with authority. See, the difference between the enemy's quoting scripture and God quoting scripture is one was used to break something down. The other one was used to build something up. There are a lot of folks, even preachers today, that use scriptures because they want to push an agenda and they break things down. You've got folks standing in pulpits right now. They've forsaken the word of God. They've forsaken the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're, pre- they're preaching movements and they're preaching hatred and they're preaching divisiveness and they're preaching politics and they're preaching, they're preaching uh, election year and that's all they're focused on because they don't trust the gospel to do the right thing so they figure they better change something or folks might vote for the wrong man or folks might go to wrong way or folks might allow the wrong things to happen but can I tell you there is nothing that's ever stood more true to me than the word of God there is no man that can take me where the word of God can take me there is no moment there is no message there is no movie there is no book that can take me where the word of God can take me because the word of God is the living breathing word of Jesus Christ can somebody say amen he goes on to say If you'll throw yourself off this cliff, doesn't your Bible say that he will give your angels charge over you? And he will protect you? And he will make sure you're okay? And then 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 Jesus says it again. It is written, devil, do not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't think just because you believe God can do it. You're supposed to just go out with your prideful muscle and start proving folks around you. I have never seen so much divisiveness in the church as I have in these last few years when folks are more concerned with muscling their way through Scripture, muscling their, I want you to hate yourself for what you believe because of what I discovered and what I believe. I want to show you how you're, going to be, you're wrong and you're going to hell for what you believe because I found something in Scripture that I believe. And we have used the word to punish. We have used the word to stripe. We have used the word to whip. We have used the word to cut. But my Bible says it is a sharp two-edged sword. Amen. And if I'm using it to cut you, chances are the reflection is going to cut me. And I can't judge you or else I have become a judge of the law and there is but one judge of the law. Amen. And I'm here to tell you today in this place this morning that God did not put you here to cut people with Scripture. He put you, he, he put you here to to reprove, to correct, and to build up, and to encourage. And if what you are preaching does not draw people to God, then what you are preaching is of your own agenda. Oh, it's just the truth. That's why they're mad, because I'm preaching truth. It ain't about preaching truth. You can preach truth and hate, and it become wrong. 
I have never in my life seen so many Facebook preachers as I have over these last few years. Facebook anointings. These Facebook prophets. These Facebook theologians. They can get on there. They'll tell you real quick they don't attend church because they don't believe in religion. But they attend church every Sunday because they're looking for material to talk about on Facebook all week long. They're attending church every Sunday. You know what? Amen. Kudos to them. Praise the Lord. I hope God will get a hold of them one day. Because it ain't about me showing you how wrong you are and how right I am. It's about showing you that the truth is to be revealed and it does not come through me and it does not come through them. It comes through Jesus Christ alone. And if you will seek him, you will find Find him. Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. He says that right after he says resist the devil and he will flee from you. The last temptation as I get ready to close was he took Jesus up and he showed him all of the kingdoms of the earth. And he says Jesus if you, you whooping me with the scripture stuff, so I'm not even going to try that again. If you would just bow before me, I will make you a ruler of all of this. But it goes to show you that the enemy in all of his years of coming after the plans of God, how ignorant he really is of who God is. Because does he not know that the earth is God's and the fullness thereof? That God owns the cattle of a thousand hills? That this world was created and at the end of all said and done, this world will pass away. But the world to come will be eternal. A new heaven and a new earth, the Bible says, he will make for us. We are going to a place, to a city Whose builder and maker is God. But going back to where I started this sermon. The only way you can be tempted is by something your flesh desires. So how did the enemy tempt Jesus? Can I tell you that this is your proof that Jesus was 100% man. That there was that little whisper in his ear. That said, you'll never have to work again, Jesus. All you have to do is just give in. And you'll have the whole world. He was trying to talk him out of his divine destiny. By tempting him with fame and fortune of the world. Jesus was the son of God. He left a throne in heaven to come to this earth. He, he, all he had ever known from the foundation of this world was the presence of God to be in a perfect kingdom. To be a, to seated at the right hand of the Father. And he comes in this world and the enemy has the ability to tempt Jesus. Because Jesus was a man. Jesus did not live out his 33 and a half years with some super power that Yielded him from any a temptation of the devil. He dealt with mental issues that we deal with. He just knew how to pray on the healing to them. He dealt with the same temptations of the heart that we deal with, except he knew how to pray through them. He dealt with the same heartbreaks and heartaches. As a matter of fact, when Lazarus died, the Bible says, the shortest verse of the Bible, Jesus wept. But he knew how to pray his way through them. He remained perfect and holy through all of those things. And he lives today as our sacrifice. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. The word of God is your tool to make the enemy flee. If you don't learn anything else in all of your life, you need to learn the Word of God. If you don't trust in anything else in all of your life, you need to trust in the Word of God. Before you start looking at maps, before you start looking at careers, before you start looking at marriages, you need to look at the Word of God. Because there is an adversary, the devil, who goes about to and fro from all the earth 
seeking whom he may devour. He's coming with temptation that will be pleasing to the eyes and to man. Joshua 1 and 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want a successful life? It's not going to come through the 12 steps on how to get rich. It's not going to come through the amount of degrees you can put on your wall. God might take you along the process that requires those degrees. And I'm all for education. I support it 100%. But I'm telling you, just getting the education and just getting the document on the wall is not going to get you your success or bring you your prosperity in the kingdom of God. But it is when you meditate on the Word of God day in and day out, and you don't let it leave your mouth. Don't let it leave your mind. Don't it, When you talk, let talk in the reflection of the Word of God. Don't let it leave your mouth. Don't let it depart from you. Keep it here. Keep it with you. Share it, but keep it. Share it, but keep it. Don't let it leave you. Don't let it sit out for one conversation because that will be the one conversation the enemy slips his tool in. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Can you stand to your feet all over the house this morning? This is for Northwoods specific. Late last night, God began to deal with me on something, and I just, it it didn't settle with me, and I couldn't understand it this morning. I woke up, and when I was in my office this morning getting ready, I just heard the Spirit of the Lord just speak to me. He spoke to me directly first. He said, Josh, do not get away from the very thing that brought you to me. Do not get away from the very thing that brought you to me. And he said, now I want you to tell my people that the tempter is here. He will tempt you with the ways of the world, with the popularity of the world, with the significance of the world. He will utilize grand speakers. He will utilize grand sounds. He said, but tell my people that their power does not come from anything other than my word. It's not by might nor by power, but by by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4 and 6. I can put a sign up at that door right now. No devils allowed. And that's going to be what draws them in. I just, I'm not here to get on you this morning. I'm here to tell you, you've got power and you've got authority this morning. But you've got to take it serious. I mean, you've got to get more serious than you've ever been right now. And I'm not talking about just for the church service. I'm talking about for your walk in God. When you leave this place, what are you doing? Where are you going? Who are you going with? What are you, what are you going to be thinking about? What are you going to let the enemy speak to you about? 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 27. There's a famine in Syria. And the king of Syria is up walking on a wall. And there's this woman on the outside walking. And their eyes made contact. And that woman looked up at the king of Syria. And she says, King, help me. And what the king said blew me away. He said, if God don't help us, who will? 
it was, I, I'm, I'm, I, I got in the story because I'm studying for a sermon next week. So I don't want to give too much away. But it had gotten so bad in Syria that they were eating the dung of doves, the heads of donkeys, and boiling their own children. Today we'll eat my son, boil him and eat my son. Next week, tomorrow we'll eat yours. And I'm telling you, there's some prof prophetic significance to that. So I'm encouraging you, don't miss next Sunday. You're going to miss a blessing. But I come across this story where I read in 2 Kings and it just hit me because I knew what I was preaching this morning about making the devil flee. This woman said, help me. And the king said, if the Lord don't help us, who will? And then what he said next was, again, prophetic significance. He said, the barn floors are empty and the wine presses are broken. The barn was where the wheat was stored. They had eaten everything in the storehouse, and it was empty where the wheat was stored. The wine presses were broken for the, the place where they would get their joy. They would get their, 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 their calmness. They would get their peace. The wine presses were broken. So the place where the wheat was was empty, and the place where their joy, the wine came, was broken. And all I heard God saying was the barn of wheat was my word and the wine press was my spirit he said and people were feeding on what had been stored up from past generations but we're living in a day where the barn houses are empty and the wine presses are broken we're not operating in the spirit we're just operating on popularity things we're operating on feelings we're operating on what feels right for the moment but can I tell you church what's going to break this can I tell you church what's going to make a difference in all of this can I tell you what's going to help this nation can I tell you what's going to change things it ain't going to be marching in the streets it ain't going to be burning down businesses it ain't going to be getting the right man elected it's going to be when we got a true divine Bible revival in this nation where people go to the word and people stand on the word and people preach the word regardless of who it offends regardless of who it hurts and regardless of who it breaks because I promise you if God allows this word to break anyone it's because he's about to build you stronger than you ever was God don't break what he don't fix better God don't hurt what he don't heal God don't defend what he won't defend amen if you'll just let the word of God do what it's going to do to you we got to have a full-blown Bible revival I'm not talking about a, a series of meetings where we pay a man to come stay in a motel and, 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 get, and eat good and get a check at the end of the week I'm talking about a Bible revival where you and I the natural folks the, the home folks walk into the church already full already full and ready because let me tell you something there is no limit on the anointing of God do you want me to tell you the only thing that limits the anointing of God is the amount of vessels you're willing to bring. You bring one vessel, God's going to fill up one vessel. But if you'll go borrow vessels from the whole town, God will fill them up to every one of them's full. God's all is not limited. It's only limited by what we bring. If you come in here ready, I promise you, a Bible revival is going to break out and there is going to be some devils running up out of Thomasville, Georgia and there's going to be some, there's going to be some armies rising up. There's going to be some children taking back their places. I'm telling you, church, the enemy has a plan for Thomasville. The enemy has a plan for this nation, but I'm telling you, with the sermon I got for next week, God's already showing me there is a, a scheme of the devil that if we don't catch this, if we don't take it serious, we're not only going to lose our freedom to worship God. It's already here. Churches right now on Sunday morning in California aren't allowed to sing because of fear of the virus. But I encourage you to go out in the streets and yell and protest. But don't sing praises. But my Bible tells me, sing unto him a new song. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. 
Don't tell me that this is just for our safety anymore. When it all first started, I was all about wisdom. I was all about using protection. I was all about being right. But let me tell you, when you start coming against praise and worship, when you start coming against the thing that glorifies my God, when you start coming against the incense that, that is in the nostrils of my Savior, and you start tearing those things down, but you're giving me freedom to go out and shed hate, you have just revealed yourself, devil. You have just revealed your cards, uh, and I'm going all in because I know what you got. I know what you're holding, and I can tell you if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I, I don't want anybody to get uncomfortable this morning. But like I said last week, I just feel like there was going to be a couple weeks of evangelizing. And I ain't never went to a revival where I didn't give someone to call for hand, laying on our hands. And if you are uncomfortable with it, I understand. And I don't put any condemnation on you because I promise you God can touch you right where you're at. But I feel an urgency in my spirit. Brother Ryan, I, I'm the same way as you. I didn't know what it was, but I have pressured all week. And I, when you said it, it made a lot of sense. Uh, amen. Because of the things that people are having to deal with and go through, we are blind to half of it because we don't see it in the home. But you've got an opportunity to worship this morning. You've got an opportunity to put the enemy to flight. If one can put a thousand to flight two could put 10,000. You say, Brother Josh, I'm not that deep in Scripture. I'm not that deep in the church. and I don't know a whole lot about this. Listen, God ain't even asking you to know anything. He's asking you to trust Him to step onto the unknown waters, stepping out into the unknown territory. He'll do the rest. You just step out in faith and He'll do the rest. You say, I'm not, well, I'm not, I'm not all that far into it. God doesn't need your knowledge. He wants to fill you with His. So what I'm going to ask this morning, if you're here this morning, as they get ready to worship and sing, if you're okay with it, I want to pray for you. There's some devils in your life that don't belong there. And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about spirits. Now, I can't tell you when the spirit goes that the people won't go with them. But I'm here to tell you it's the spirit that we're looking at right now. There is a war in the heavenlies, and I want to help you this morning. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. And I believe I'm going to put my faith with your faith. My wife's here. We got some folks that will pray with you. We got some folks that will believe with you. And I promise you that the revelation of God is much more powerful than the revelation of man. And the revelation of God will defy every temptation the enemy comes at you with. So as they get ready to worship, if you don't feel comfortable coming up here, please just worship where you are. Pray and just ask God, Lord, let me be a fountain of your word so that when the enemy comes against my life and my family, he knows he can't stay. Hallelujah.
say that again. Raise your voice and say, Amen. 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 Just one more time we say, Stop working, 
never stop, you never stop moving. never be the same no I'll never be the same I'll never be the same so stop think about it yeah ask yourself are you living the life God had planned out are you giving praise every day you scream and shout are you reading your bibles and actually walking it out and do you stand up for the lord jesus christ do you love him enough to give up your life do you go without true sacrifice or deny like peter know he paid the price see there's too many times we try to do it on our own that is all it in my life a broken vessel cry lord i need your help Of praise this morning. Two miracles happened in this place this morning. I want to tell you the first one. The first one is there's some folks that broke away from things the devil thought they'd never get out of. When the devil sent that last attack on you, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but you know who you are. When the enemy sent that last attack on you, he did it with the assurance, this will be the one that takes them out. But here you are today, standing in your freedom in Christ. The second miracle is not so much spiritual, but I got you out of here by 1230. Amen. It's 1230 right now. Again, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you to our online family as always. You are a blessing to us. And we are praying for you where you're at as you pray for us. But before you leave today, please, if you signed up for the principles and process of Bible, biblical study um, and you are unsure if we have your contact information, just make sure, just stop and make sure that uh, we got it and we'll uh, create a group text message and I'll send the code out to you tomorrow. And we'll just make sure everybody knows how to log on. That way, if you can't log on, you can contact us, and we'll talk you through it and get it figured out. That way, next Monday, um, we'll be able to start. Again, we're going to be opening the class, the Zoom, at about 6.50, um, Just click on Join the Meeting. Put that code in. It should bring you straight to us, and then we'll, we'll discuss tomorrow how the actual class is going to work. Um, keep praying for those that are still 
um, unable to come and be with us. We got a lot that are that takes us every week, and it is breaking their heart not to be able to come be with us. But I want to one time, I know everybody, a lot of people in here has been praying. I want everybody, let's give a, a big hand. See Brother Rick and Sister Patricia back with us. Hey, man, it's so good to have them back. We've been praying hard, and she had a fight on her hands. Yes, sir. Hello, hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to believe with you, Lord, that you'll just bless her with another negative test, Lord God. And Father, we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. So good to have each of you with us. Please, 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 please don't miss next Sunday morning. I believe it's going to be good. I want you guys to come back and fired up and ready. Please don't wait for the music to start to start getting hyped up. Come in here ready to worship. Come in here excited about God. And I promise you, your attitude is the only thing that changes the atmosphere of God and what He can do in your life. So we invite you to come next Sunday. We invite you to come in excited and fired up. We look forward to having you, Father. As we leave this place today, God, go with them, prepare them, protect them, and bring them back safely in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't forget Wednesday night Bible study. We'll be back this Wednesday night. God bless. Pentecostal fire is stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon.